can I start by asking for a volunteer to take some notes? Sure, I can do that. Thank you. I'm going to drop the uh, meeting doc in the chat. Okay, why don't we get started then? Um, let's kick it off with a quick update on some uh, release activity. Uh, Alex, I think you were going to talk to us a little bit about Calico 313. Yeah, um, so Calico 313 went out um, last week. Um, the, the major headline a uh, new feature in there is the tech preview of the eBPF uh, data plane, which we're pretty excited about. Um, we've, uh, we've published a blog on that. I'll, I'll copy that into the, um, the channel chat in a second. Um, so the blog details kind of uh, the performance benefits and some of the functional uh, benefits we've made. Um, but in summary, I'd say um, we're able to you know, scale data plane throughput slightly higher. Um, he uses less CPU per kind of gigabit that you're shifting through the network. Um, and it has native support for handling Kubernetes services. Um, so you don't need to run uh, Kube proxy uh, if you're running Calico in eBPF mode. Um, and this gives you um, slightly better um, latency uh, for first, first connections to services. Uh, it also is able to preserve the um, external client source IP address all the way to the, the pods backing the service, um, which is super useful for things like network policy. Um, we have support for um, direct server return, uh, which allows you to basically eliminate one network hop uh, when, you're, when you're routing to services from outside the cluster. Um, and it uses less CPU than QProxy and IP tables or IPVS mode to keep the data plane in sync. Um, so we're pretty excited about where we've got to uh, with this tech preview. It's, it's definitely not ready for production. Um, we know it's got a, a, quite a few rough edges. Um, it's not had that much testing. Um, we know there's some, lim some uh, limitations with how it handles MTUs, for example. Um, so all of those will be getting fixed over the next few weeks, uh, ready for a GA release. Beyond eBPF, um, there's a, a handful of bug fixes went into 3.13 that are detailed in the release notes. Um, and there was a, um, an adjustment to uh, auto detect the pod cider in kubeadm install scenarios. Um, which I think will make kubeadm users' uh, lives easier once we um, update the kubeadm docs to let people know how to use that. Um, and we made various uh, Calico docs improvements as well. Like um, we went live with some of the geeky details stuff that we that we demoed in the previous uh, community meeting. Uh, I think that's probably about it for three thirteen. Cool. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, any, if anybody has any questions on that, feel free to reach out. And I think we also have uh, Tomas here, who is one of the EBPF experts working on that stuff. So uh, we can answer some technical questions later too. Yeah, or ask now if, you, if you've got any burning questions, happy to talk about it. Um, so I can talk a little bit about Calico 3.14, which is uh, on the horizon, uh, showing up on the horizon. Um, we're st still starting to look at what, what the scope for that might be um, and, and timeline for that. But there are a few things that um, we are, are looking into. So uh, one thing that that we know is going in. Um, we've been working on how to make our story around um, policy enforcement for hosts um, a little bit nicer and, and easier. Uh, so one of the things that um, 
we've done there is uh, implement kind of automatic creation of host endpoint resources. Um, and when I say creation, I mean creation, updating, deletion, um, full lifecycle management for those as nodes come and go in the cluster. Um, so that should make uh, managing those quite a bit simpler. And then there are some other uh, policy improvements in that area as well. Um, trying to make more types of policy compatible with um, the various types of host endpoints to make that more intuitive. Um, so that's that's one effort that we're we're looking at for three fourteen. Um, there are a couple other uh, things that are in the the scoping phase, um, which may come in for three fourteen or may may come in slightly after. Um, one of which, uh, Brad, I know you're interested in, is the um, ability to migrate from etcd data store to the Kubernetes API uh, using CRDs. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that one. Uh, still, still looking at scoping. So um, it's a it's a non-trivial bit of work to do, and may uh, may be a 3.14 or a 3.15 thing. But um, hopefully we can we can pull that one in. Uh, I would say we're we're probably looking at about a six week. Um, six to eight week uh, from now release cycle for that, but that'll solidify a bit more as we uh, narrow in on some of the the finer details on these. Um, Eric, you want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the operator side of things? Yeah, sure. Um, so some of the recent things that have um, uh, features that we've added. Um, uh, one thing was, um, uh, so we provided a means to specify a registry, but with that, it was uh, expected that the, um, that we would, you know, all the images would have their own, or well, not all have their own, but there'd be just a couple paths. We would use the ones that were in the operator, um, but there's been requests to uh, be able to specify that so all images that the operator uses uh, can now be configured to come from one specific uh, namespace path or org whatever you want to call it I think different registries call it different stuff um, so that's been added um, also um, IP pool block size uh, is configurable for the initial one um, so the, those two features have been released um, upcoming uh, release, uh, we will have a flex volume configuration, uh, which includes disabling flex volume, but also in the uh, um, setups where we don't auto detect correctly the path that the flex volume needs to be installed at, um, then it, it can be configured through the API. Also, um, we're uh, documenting uh, install time resource creation. So right now, uh, operator, you have to, um, you have to basically install the operator and then after Calico components are up, then you could create like Calico resources like BGP peers and configuration like that. But we're documenting and doing updates to allow that to be allow the user to be able to create that at start so that they exist as the cluster is coming up. Um, so that should be uh, good for for some BGP config stuff that's needed. Um, and then also a few other things. There's uh, right now the uh, rolling update, uh, like when you're upgrading for node is um, kind of our default of one allowed at a time and that can be problematic in large clusters where there might be nodes out or it I mean it just take a long time so uh, we're gonna allow configuration of that um, and also another uh, minor thing is the port map um, CNI plugin is uh, I think a bit um, not very performant and so in some clusters uh, 
uh, sometimes. I don't know that it's all the time that it's that bad, but um, it helps in some cluster to be able to disable that. So we're going to add that feature to disable. Um, but and that those are expected to be out um, probably next week, um, barring no issues there. Uh, but yeah, so kind of a recent or very soon upcoming things. Uh, I'm not really prepared for the longer than that, but uh, there will be more stuff coming after. Cool. <clears throat> Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Um, any questions on uh, 314 or operator stuff before we move along? Yeah, this is Brad. I had a question about the automatic host endpoint creation. Um, is that going to be, are you going to be able to configure and say, I want host endpoints for a given interface, or is that just going to happen for all interfaces that find? Uh, yeah, good question. So the, um, what we've implemented so far is for all interfaces on the host. So it kind of treats the entire host as one logical entity. Um, okay. So well, then I guess my next question is, once you do that, all traffic's blocked, right? Uh, it's not. So the, the one of the user experiences that we wanted to provide was um, basically the same semantics you get for uh, like pods in a Kubernetes cluster. So default allow until selected by some policy that impacts that traffic. Um, okay. So, so for this particular, you're right in that uh, per interface host endpoints do create a default deny when you create them. Um, but Calico supports, um, I guess, what we call wild carded host interfaces that apply to all uh, network okay. interfaces, and those are not default deny when you create them. Um, okay, so the obviously that would be kind of problematic. <laughs> okay, so the auto create will be a wildcard host interface. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, right. I'm just asking because we do that right now in IKS to auto create them for the interfaces we care about. So. Right. So okay, sounds good. Yeah, it would be cool to see if this. Uh, if this sort of overlaps with that function or or provides the same. Um, capabilities that you're using it for today um, or if there yeah, are gaps there. You need to be able to create two separate ones, one for public, one for private, and label them differently so we can put different policies on the different ones. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's a use case we discussed and uh, would like to support but probably aren't doing for the first increment here. Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. The the auto endpoints inherit the, the node labels? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's... Oh, sorry. Oh, I, well, yeah, sorry. I wasn't sure who you were addressing, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> but it sounds like they yeah. both do. <laughs> yeah, they both, they both do. So you, so you could, in theory, do that use case, I think. As long as you label sure. it. We want to apply a certain policy to say, yeah. Bond zero are public and a different policy to bond one. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. okay. Cool. Just uh, one quick clarifying question for the notes. When you were talking about 314, did you say six to eight weeks for 314 or six to eight weeks for etcd to Kubernetes data store migration? Um, that, was, that was just a rough uh, timeline for the actual release. Thanks. Um, so I have a couple things I would like to talk about in the hot issues section. Um, and others can feel free to jump in if there are issues they'd like to talk about, but I'll kick us off. Um, there's a, um, uh, another issue in the IPAM area. Um, that we discovered recently or having to do with upgrades from Calico 3.6 to Calico 3.9, if I remember the versions correctly. Um, 
So specifically to do with um, the handling of tunnel IP addresses. Uh, so I'll, I'll put a link to the PR. Um, we have a fix in the works for that, but um, the result is that some IP addresses will get uh, get leaked if you do an upgrade from a version of Calico prior to 3.6 uh, to a version of Calico after 3.9 um, in some situations. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll stick a link in. We have a, a fix ready and we'll be um, backporting that. Uh, Tarek, I'm just going to stick it in the chat and you can put it in the notes. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about on the issues front, um, a few of us were talking recently about the way that we categorize issues. Um, uh, becoming a little bit clear that our existing priority labels were not uh, applied super consistently and it was maybe hard to do that uh, across multiple people who would be, um, you know, making those calls. Uh, and also that it's not really obvious what like priority P1 versus P2 means. Um, so we're trying to, to brainstorm ways to make that uh, more, more intuitive and, and um, easier to understand. Um, the current uh, leading proposal there, which we're, we're probably going to try, is switching from a, a single priority label to um, kind of uh, multi-axis, so having two separate labels that, that cover what we thought were the, the two major um, qualities of an issue that, that determined its priority. So um, the first of those we're calling like likelihood, which is, you know, how prevalent is this issue? How, how likely is it to uh, impact any given user? Um, and then the second is uh, what we're calling impact or, or really the severity, like how, how severe is this once it happens in a cluster? Um, and we're hoping that between the two of those, it will be one, a lot easier to consistently apply that across issues. Um, and then uh, to more, more obvious to people viewing issues sort of, you know, should I, should I care about this? Um, and then we can use the, the combination of that really uh, to um, still build out like tiers of priority. So something with likelihood high and impact high is clearly a high priority where likelihood low and impact low is uh, a smaller one. Um, so I just wanted to share that, that that's probably coming down the, the pike. So if you're looking at issues and see that change, don't get uh, too surprised. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely reach out to me with feedback or other thoughts if you are interested in this area. Did uh, anybody else have any issues they wanted to bring to the group's attention? Nope. Okay. Um, why don't we move on to some Calico Heroes? Uh, anybody have any shout outs they'd like to make for people doing awesome stuff in the community? Yeah, yeah, I have one for Brendan, uh, who's, yeah, <laughs> thanks for doing the, the flex volume change, the initial change looked pretty good. Um, kind of helped us get our stuff going as well. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to try the bits since we made the additional changes to, to not only disable, but to change the mount point. Uh, but yeah, thanks for, for doing that, it's pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, I want to second that and also add in thanks for uh, doing some code reviews on the operator code too. I noticed some uh, approvals there and that's super valuable. I try to uh, pay attention to the stuff that we're directly impacted yeah. by at <laughs> least. So yeah, no problem.
I have a shout out to Turk for self isolating. <laughs> Even though it's not, it's not the coronavirus, it's just a regular flu virus. Thank you for not sharing that. Oh, well. <laughs> I'd like to give a shout out. I guess it sounds like Casey, you're working on the SCD to KDD migration, and whoever else has been involved. That's a, been on our list for a long time, and we do understand it's definitely not a trivial thing uh, to try and get done without any downtime. So appreciate appreciate the effort and the work there. So thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I've been looking at that a little bit, and Spike Curtis, who's not on the call this week, has has also been investigating that quite a bit. Okay, great. I also, I also wanted to give a shout out to Spike too, since we mentioned his name, that for, uh, for the work that he's done on um, isolating the, uh, the, the recent memory leak that was related to one of the gold Go modules, HTTP2 modules. Um, Spike has been working on a tool that, will, that he used for debugging that will help um, hopefully you know, we'll be able to give that back to the community and help other community members debug similar problems where um, you have memory that just isn't being let go and, you know, being able to trace that down to exactly where it is. So um, I don't think Spike is here, but uh, I wanted to give a shout out to him for, um, for that work. Yeah, absolutely. That's some difficult debugging. If there are no more shout outs, then why don't we um, hand the floor over to Alois, who uh, is here to tell us a bit about the Calico VPP project. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Alois. Thanks, Casey, for uh, giving us this opportunity to present uh, this work we've been doing. Um, so I have a couple slides. Could I share them? Yes, absolutely. Uh, need to give Zoom permission to recall my screen. Oh, you don't have permission. Um, uh, I'm not using Zoom often enough. Ah, I may need to reconnect to the call. Oh, damn. Sorry about that. I will be back in 30 seconds. It looks good, but if you're speaking, we can't hear you, or at least I can't. I think I think you're on mute, maybe. You are right. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right. So yeah, thanks for giving us the opportunity to present this. So um, I'm part of the VPP team at Cisco with Nathan, and we've been working on um, an integration with Calico. Um, mostly an experiment for now, but we'd like to see uh, where it goes. Um, so just as you may not be super familiar with, with uh, VPP, uh, we'll start with a quick intro. So VPP is a full user space uh, networking data plane uh, project. Uh, it's under the LF umbrella within the fast data project. Uh, the website is fd.io. It's open source, um, it is extensible, it works in every architecture, every environment you can imagine from Raspberry Pis to 100 core uh, Xeon uh, servers. And it's really, really optimized for performance. This is really the key selling point for VPP. Uh, we have spent tons of time optimizing it, uh, using vector instructions, being very careful about um, cache usage, we use DPDK to support most network interfaces. 
but we have native drivers for some, which give us a slight performance boost. And we have uh, what you would expect from a networking data plane, full layer two to four uh, networking. So switching, routing, tunneling, we support IPIP and VXLAN, of course. Uh, and we have some transport protocols as well that are implemented, so TCP, um, UDP, QUIC, stuff like that. Uh, and the API is really fast. It's based on a shared memory and it allows to do more than 200K updates per second. Um, so the idea was to use that in a Kubernetes context, context um, in order to see if we could improve the performance compared to the kernel. So that was really the, the initial uh, point. The performance is really the main goal here. Uh, there are multiple aspects to performance. There is the raw data plane forwarding uh, performance, uh, especially in the presence of NAT or many load balancing rules or so like, things like that. And also the ability to quickly react to updates, uh, especially in large clusters, given that VPP's API is pretty fast, we, we think it can be um, more convenient than NetLink in reacting to services updates, for instance, in large clusters. Um, and also the fact that VPP is user space means that you can change stuff without having to touch the kernel. So it's pretty nice. Um, just from an operational point of view, you don't have coupling between your, uh, your OS, your kernel, and your Kubernetes network. You can change everything in your network without uh, having to change your infrastructure. And it makes it easy to try new features because of VPP's modularity and, um, and uh, extensive uh, internal APIs. Um, so at the high level, the way this works is um, that we deploy VPP in a container running in the daemon set uh, just next to Calico node. Uh, one important point to note is that it's compatible with regular, what we call regular is um, Calico nodes without VPP. So you can have some Calico nodes with VPP in your cluster and some without. Um, and you can migrate some to VPP if you want to. Um, so being user space networking stack, uh, VPP takes ownership um, of the uplink interface of the node, uh, meaning that you will not see it uh, on, the, on the host. If you run an IP add, uh, you won't see your interface anymore once VPP starts. Um, but VPP will restore the connectivity to the host once it's up with um, a tap interface. And so VPP in this integration will take ownership of everything that Calico implements with IP tables or IPVS or eBPF now. Um, that includes, of course, container interfaces, but also uh, service load balancing, which is usually done by kubeproxy, uh, and the policies and all the Calico features, encapsulation, etc. Um, and so instead of uh, Viet interfaces, containers get Tap interfaces with a Virtio backend, um, which we have optimized for performance uh, using multiple queues, uh, enabling GSO, and so on and so on. Um, and so the host side of the container interface is also not visible in your host anymore, it's visible in VPP instead. And in order to plug ourselves under Calico, we use the Felix Data Plane API. So that's uh, useful for the uh, policies, mostly. Um, for the CNI, we require a small modification. Um, so we have a, an open PR, which I actually need to update, um, to also provide a, a generic uh, data plane API for the CNI, similar to the one in, uh, in Felix. Um, and yeah, so the, uh, for the CNI, we use a socket, which is shared between the host and the uh, VPP uh, agents that we use, uh, transmitting messages uh, using gRPC to, to send interface creation requests to VPP and deletion requests. Um, so at a high level, from a network point of view, this is what the, the network looks like. So instead of having ownership of the public interface, the host is now hidden behind VPP in a way. Um, and VPP does all the network processing for the containers. It provides tap interfaces to all the pods. 
uh, and one for the host as well uh, in order to run BGP, Kubelet Felix, and all the host services uh, as you would on a regular Calico cluster. Um, so this is the, the this is what it looks like when you have one applic interface. If uh, we did it that way because it enables us to deploy this integration without having any more requirements uh, than Calico. In particular, we don't require to have two network interfaces. If in your cluster you do have two network interfaces, you can also uh, not use the tap interface on the left for all the control plane stuff, but use a separate network interface for that. Um, just as an option. Uh, and that's the software view. Um, there's a lot of info on this slide. I won't dig into everything, but feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, so just at a high level, um, we have, uh, in, in the deployment, we have the Calico VP node, which, uh, well, pod, which contains two containers. One container contains a VPP and a small manager on the right. So the manager is like the equivalent of a net plan or its network interfaces for VPP. It will just do the basic IP configuration and restore it, uh, restore the Linux configuration uh, when VPP exits. If you want to uninstall your VPP or if VPP crashes um, so that your host uh, gets its network connectivity back. Um, and this communic well, this uh, also communicates with the Calico part of the integration um, through the VPP API socket, um, which is driven by many things, uh, including Felix, the Kubernetes API, the Calico API for the BGP demand configuration and for the tunneling configuration, uh, and the CNI plugin for the interfaces, of course. For BGP, we use um, a GoBGP based agent, uh, which uh, interoperates uh, nicely with Bird, um, but allows us to have uh, the Calico VPP agent as a single Go binary, uh, which is quite convenient. Uh, and so regarding the status of this project, it is open source, it's available on GitHub. Um, we support no IPv4 container addressing and routing, uh, cluster IP and node port services load balancing, and IP IP encapsulation. Uh, and so we are working both on um, supporting additional features and optimizing it. So for the features, we are looking at policies, IPv6 and VXN support. And for the optimizations, we are looking at uh, GSO and LRO, which um, really have a big impact on the ability to process packets in the Linux stack behind VPP. Uh, and also we're looking at doing, uh, at improving the NAT implementation to have higher performance on the load balancing. And of course, anything else that comes up, uh, well, there are many other things that we, we can do. So thank you for listening. Uh, if we have time, um, maybe we can take a few questions if you have any. Yeah, we've totally got time. Does anybody have some some questions? Can I just uh, ask? Um, is this how how do you see this? Is this um, a kind of experimental project, or is it something that um, you're you're kind of is is leading somewhere sp specific, or is already rolled out to um, some customers? Um, so yeah, uh, fair question. Um, we we have um, internal uh, customers who are interested in that at Cisco. Uh, it's not yet a product or it's not something that's shipping yet. Um, so it may become a product, but it's, uh, for now it's uh, still very early. I have a question um, back on the the architecture slide, um, you said you had a GoBGP based agent running in there. Um, is that a replacement for uh, the bird um, implementation that, that ships with uh, upstream Calico or does that run alongside it in some way? Uh, it is a replacement for bird, yes. Um, we, yeah, we remove bird. Uh, and so the thing is we needed to uh, install the routes in VPP in a way, and uh, GoBGP makes that a lot easier than Bird. 
because we can just uh, plug our API below GoBGP, whereas with Bird, we would have had to patch it and recompile it. Uh, right. So yeah, I suppose uh, Bird doesn't know how to program, uh, yep. program DPDK. So, so just to understand, so that's quite interesting. So, um, so that means that the Go BGP is doing all of the all of the BGP stuff that, that Bird would do as well, but it's also kind of providing a representation of those routes into VPP so that you can do other things with them. Yes, absolutely. So um, Go BGP is doing all the BGP exchanges with its peers, and then we have a small layer below that that translates all the route updates into VPP API messages and sends them, installs them into VPP. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I, I suppose that's um, that, that replaces what, what would normally be Bird programming the, the Linux kernel. Exactly, um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess, I guess one of the things that all of this is doing is that it's really reducing the dependencies on Linux as the underlying operating system as well. So presumably you could run on other OSs underneath this. Right, so, well, in a way, yes, but we still, uh, so yes, it does reduce a lot the friction with Linux, uh, but we still need to provide a consistent networking um, API to the containers, meaning that for now we provide tap interfaces to the containers. Of course, having VPP in there also enables some other options like providing more efficient uh, user space interfaces like MemIF, but that would require specific support from the container. So it doesn't. Have, yep. Go ahead. Do you have uh, Do you have any preliminary kind of performance uh, numbers or anything that you could could share? Uh, given this is primarily aimed at um, you know being a super efficient data plane. Um, not yet, unfortunately. Cool. It'd be great. It'd be great. I'm looking forward to seeing those. Um, this Thanks. is an exciting project. Thank you. So I have a sort of a comment, I guess it's a question, but I haven't, I talked to Alex about this once um, about, you know, the idea that, you know, you could just, if you're building a CNI, you could always just use all the Calico bits and then build the data plane out underneath it. If you wanted to change things, this is, I guess, a really good example of that. And I'm just curious, is this, are there other canonical examples of projects that have done this successfully? Um, uh, that that are actively being developed using the the data plane API that Calico has. You mean? Okay. Well, I mean, it looks like you know you're using all the stuff that we like about Calico. You're using Felix and all that. Um, I assume so. You still get your network policies and all that stuff working, but you you have a different data plane here, right? And I'm just wondering. Yeah, I mean, in, in a sense, it's using the same API. Um, you know, when we add, when we added the eBPF data plane, uh, that's kind of the same thing. It's plugging into the same API. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and um, Tiger also have like a Windows data plane which plugs into the same API, and that's not that's not open source though. But the eBPF data plane is. Okay. Cool. So this is really, as far as I know, this is the first non tigera uh, non non calico based like reference implementation of how to use calico. Basically, which is pretty cool, like plugging it out, plugging out the data plane, which is which is really interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, my, Microsoft wrote the original Windows uh, data plane for calico. Uh, it's, it's had a quite a long history. Um, so that so there's other folks who who use this. Okay, cool. Yeah. Is is it also related to the API that we use for Dicastes for the um, application layer policy um, interface? I, th I think it might be close, if not exactly the same. It, it's um, it's a slightly different API. Right. So I know you mentioned um, there are some kind of uh, modularity improvements we could make to the CNI plugin to uh, 
and, and I've been chatting with you on GitHub about that. Were there um, other like challenges or areas that uh, like friction points in, in Calico when, when building this? Well, very honestly, we were surprised by how few there were actually. Um, it was a really good experience, I think. Um, we still haven't uh, fully implemented policies, so there might be some bits here and there that we haven't figured out uh, and some sticking points. But um, overall, no, it's been really, really painless to integrate with Calico. So thank you for building it that way. <laughs> Cool. That's that's nice to hear. I'll mention that to RCNI people. So I I had one more question, which is more just logistical. But um, would you be, would you be willing to share those slides with us so that we can put a link to those in the um, uh, in the in the meeting minutes? So anyone else who's interested can take a look at the, the work you've done. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, great point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, should I send them to you or post them somewhere? Um, uh, you, it's, it's sending them to me is fine, or if you just want to post a link to them in the um, in the, the the meeting document, that that works great too. Okay, thank you. I'll do. Uh, any more questions for Alois? Cool. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on and sharing that. I know uh, a lot of people are are very interested in uh, in the work you've been doing there. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, so that brings us to more general Q and A. If there are other questions or topics people uh, wanted to to chat about, I. I if no one else has anything, I have something that's probably low priority, but I'll wait till the end. Start us off, Jay. Okay. Yeah, I have, um, if you want, we've integrated some of, you know, those, those new network policy tests that we have. Um, so we've integrated them. Obviously they were kind of born of some, some stuff that I kind of stole from, from you all. So I would, I feel like, I would feel like I would be unethical for me to not, uh, volunteer to integrate those at Semaphore if it was valuable. But I don't know, you know, how your network policy test coverage is now um, and whether we need um, any extra coverage or whatnot. But we're running it locally here over here at VMware for, for our CNI stuff. And obviously our goal is to get it, uh, you know, and I think we're pretty aligned upstream to get them into upstream. Um, but we're building images and everything. So it's super easy. For, and I have it integrated in in RCNI, so I'm happy to do the work or at least help do the work as much as I can to get it into Semaphore if that's valuable. It, I mean, it's not, I don't really, it's not a huge deal either way. If, you know, if you have good network policy test coverage now, it's not necessary. We can wait till it's an upstream. So I have some thoughts there if nobody else does. Uh, I like the idea of more tests and more thorough tests. Um, I, I think the way I was imagining this all playing out is kind of a loop through the Kubernetes upstream tests. We already have some infrastructure that, that runs those. And um, my preference is to enhance those both because it kind of blesses them as more official through through Kubernetes upstream, um, gives a chance for more more contributors to weigh in and, and review those. And then also when it gets back to us, it, it gives us one consistent framework to use for, for all of those rather than um, maybe a couple different test running frameworks. Um, so that's that's sort of the path that I'm I'm excited about seeing those taking. Um, cool. I don't know if that's still still in your plan to, to kind of go straight oh, absolutely. up. Absolutely. Yeah, we have the, we have the cap out and everything. So we've gotten a lot of drive by comments, but um, I haven't gotten like the full review yet from Bowie. He assigned himself. So um, yeah, uh, hopefully we can get 
someone to finally just officially sign off on it so I can be like, you know, tell, tell our tech leads that like, look, it's signed off on, we can do it now. Okay. Like, you yeah. know, like, so uh, I'm just waiting for that until then. Yeah. We're doing it in the, um, over in Trey. I just, so I have a home for it. So there's infrastructure that can run it, but um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Especially after, after. And I'll just, we can do it then. Especially after seeing how quickly they ran in the, uh, in your demo to sick network uh, a week ago, maybe. Oh yeah. But, uh, yeah. Pretty excited by that. Yeah, they're fast. So yeah, um, Sean was right. It's a lot faster to do it that way. So. Can I just ask, are these just, are these tests exploring the Kubernetes network policy API more thoroughly than it, it, it has been in the past by other existing tests? Yeah, it does. Um, we, I think we demoed it. I'm not sure if you were there, Neil. It was, it's just, it just makes I a think I've missed one, yeah. two by two, two by two matrix where you have, you know, namespace pod, namespace pod, namespace pod, not two by two, but n by n matrix <laughs> where you just have, you know, checking if every pod can talk to every other pod and just doing that systematically each time. And if you do that by an exec, instead of waiting for a pod to fail because it can't connect to somebody else, it's super fast, right? Yeah. The execs can run in a, in an order of 10 milliseconds or less, right? So, um, so you can, if, if you're running locally, you can basically check the all on all matrix of all connectivity, um, you know, in, in like 10 seconds or something or less. So, um, nice. So yeah, it turned out to be a lot better for us. Um, so it's more comprehensive and you know that when you apply a policy, you're not accidentally breaking some other thing and, you know, breaking some other policy and whatnot. Um, and uh, we're planning on adding some node specific stuff because we've seen issues where certain, if you have a pod on one node and a pod on another node, the policy can work differently if you have little weird like bugs in the way, um, in the way you're doing whatever people do when they <laughs> implement network policies. So, um, you know, so we're adding some other test coverage, but yeah, like Casey said, it's all going to go upstream. So hopefully we can just get someone if, uh, uh, Bowie really is the sign. So hopefully I'll just ping him today and ask him to hurry up and sign off on it. And once that's there, I'm happy to help integrating it if, if needed. Yeah, especially if they're fast, that would be great to get into Semaphore. I think one of the things that has prevented us from doing pre-commit tests for a lot of these things is that the end-to-ends just take forever to run, and you can't have a two-hour cycle on PR tests. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Although, although a lot of that is is also rig setup, but you can get past that by using Kind for the for the rig setup, and that's pretty snappy as well. So if you've yeah. got snappy rig setup and snappy tests. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, if anyone wants to run them, I, there's a Calico issue 3312. I point to the YAML. You can just kubectl create that YAML, and that's all you have to do. Everything else will happen for you. So, um, and you can just look at the logs. Um, and that's it. I don't really have much else other than that. <laughs> Good to see everybody, though. <laughs> Good to see you, too, Jay. Uh, any other questions or? So I had, a, I, had a, I had a question from, from Twitter, but it looks like it may have already been answered, um, which was, uh, is anyone using a, Q, a QVAL equivalent and or conf test to validate project Calico network policies in CI? Um, and it looks like it may have been answered. It looks like Tiger published a blog post about this, but I don't know if anyone else had any thoughts about this since we're trying to stump the maintainers. Those words in a sentence all sound familiar. <laughs> I feel like I have thought about this in the past. Uh, you said we did a blog post about it? Uh, looks like it, yeah. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, decentralized Calico uh, network security policy deployment for GitOps part two. Um, now we use um, published it in January. Yeah, I think Bikram. I think Bikram wrote a blog about that. Um, right. 
and there's a, there's a similar, what sounds like a similar question to me, which was in Calico users Slack yesterday. Someone wrote, is there a kubeval equivalent for Calico network policies? And I'm afraid I was stumped, so I didn't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Give the sound that plays when you get stumped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do I get a prize for my proxy stumping the maintainers? <laughs> you do. And I then I think the maintainers need to go away and, and read a blog. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, if there's nothing more to talk about, our next meeting as usual, is the uh, second Wednesday of the month. So I think that's April the 8th. And I'll update the uh, meeting doc with that. Good to see everybody again, and uh, thanks for coming. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you, everyone.